you know how sometimes they say like you're you're pursuing something and pursuing something and when you finally kind of just let go of it mm-hmm. it sort of happens for you i feel like that's how the fit thing came because this was like maybe a year or two after and sure enough like a year later i get this email and i was like is this for real that's Mikkel Drew Pelham, and this is the Powerful Ladies Podcast. Hey guys, I'm your host, Kara Duffy, and this is the Powerful Ladies Podcast, where I invite my favorite humans, the awesome, the up to something, and the extraordinary to come and share their story. I hope that you'll be left entertained, inspired, and moved to take action towards living your most powerful life. Mikkel Drew Pelham is a fashion designer, fashion educator, and adjunct professor at FIT in New York. She's also been a panelist on our series, A Powerful Conversation About America, Racism. On this episode, we nerd out on what it's like to really work in the fashion industry, where fashion is going, and how technology is changing all of our lives, including what we wear. Plus, we talk about her journey from freelance designer to professor at one of the most prestigious fashion schools in the world, and how all along she's been building her own fashion education business. All that and so much more coming up, but first. If you're interested in discovering what possibilities and businesses are available for you to create and to live your most fulfilling life, please visit thepowerfulladies.com forward slash coaching and sign up for a free coaching consultation with me. There is no reason to wait another day to not be living your best life when you instead could be running at full speed towards your wildest dreams today. Well, welcome to the Powerful Ladies Podcast. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. (laughs) I'm so excited to have you. Let's begin by telling everyone who's joining us today who you are and what you're up to. So I am Mikkel Drew Pelham. I am a couple of things, but they're all related to fashion. So Mm -hmm. I am a designer. I am a fashion educator. I work, I'm an adjunct professor at FIT in New York City. And then I am also a fashion entrepreneur and I teach digital fashion design training, uh, mostly Adobe Illustrator and Photoshop, um, but I'm branching off into some other things, um, but all digital technology Mm -hmm. for fashion. So when people hear about FIT, it's like the school, right? It's like that or Parsons are your two choices if you're in the U.S. and you want to get into fashion. Um, you know, what is it like being a professor at that school? Uh, it's interesting for me because I've been in the industry so long. Um, I enjoy it because part of it is that I get sort of a rush from the students because they're still really excited. Not that I'm not excited about fashion, but I've been in it so long. And, you know, there's certain things that happen within the industry that you're kind of like, oh, God, you know, but these students haven't experienced that yet. So they're still like excited about draping and excited about making a pattern and excited about designing. And then their energy kind of gives me energy and makes me remember, oh yeah, fashion's really fun and it's creative and it's exciting. So that's probably the the most fun thing about working there. Mm-hmm. Um, when, before you were a professor, what were you doing in the fashion world? Um, a designer. And mm-hmm. I actually still design. I'm an adjunct there. So it's pretty much part time. Mm-hmm. So it's like designer by day and teacher by whatever day I have to teach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, we've talked before about how, how both of us have working in fashion in common. And mm-hmm. I always think it's so interesting how when people think about fashion, they think of Vogue, they think of, you know, couture. They think of runways and fashion week. And my experience with fashion includes none of that. Absolutely yeah. none of it. Except from, you know, paying attention and watching it and seeing what's happening. Because exactly. um, fashion ultimately is everything we put on our bodies. Mm-hmm. And um, so my world's been in the sport lifestyle, street style space, even skate. Um, what specific areas have you been in in fashion? Mostly active wear. I've 
kind of worked mm-hmm. on a lot of different things for because I've been freelancing for a long time. So I was kind of like doing a little bit of a lot of things for a while I was doing men's streetwear when that was like, you know, everything in the kitchen sink was on it. Um, yeah. so it's a little more streamlined now, but at that time when everything was real tchotchkeed up, uh-huh. part of that was me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've done day wear, which is like juniors, intimate apparel, bralettes, um, sleepwear, things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I always seem to kind of gravitate back towards active wear. Like my first uh, full-time jobs before I went into freelancing was in active wear. That was my background. And then mm-hmm. the last 10 years, I had been working with Hanes Brands, um, which produces all of the champion active wear. So mm-hmm. I've been working, you know, kind of moving around in that space. And for a while, they had C9. C9 just um, ended last year. Mm-hmm. And I was working on that a lot as well. So, yeah, somehow I always gravitated back towards active wear. I always, always think of myself as a sporty spice because yes. I just I'm a T-shirt and jeans girl and a sneaker girl. And yeah, that's 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 my jam. <laughs> Me too. I could get lost in sneaker stores. Oh, and, yes. I think, <laughs> and, and footwear in particular, having started in footwear, mm. like there are some shameful photos I have of like how many shoes have ended up in my closet or house because they can't always fit in the closet. Uh-huh. Um, are you a sample size? Yes. Oh, man. <laughs> mm-hmm. Which is like a dream come true in that space. <laughs> um, and it's so much like I liked footwear as well because you can't starve yourself to like change your shoe size. Right. So there's all there's so much less pressure about um, trying to get into sample size or even caring about it. Right, right. <laughs> um, so it's like, it's it's a whole different world. And I just like it as well because to me, like, you know, street style and streetwear and this whole like blend of sport and fashion to me is so interesting. Mm-hmm. There's so much um, technical um, elements. You get to actually be working with athletes or you're collaborating with other artists or creatives, and there's a whole culture behind it. And I know that there's right. a whole culture behind couture fashion as well, but it's much more um, real from my experience. Yeah, I remember a friend of mine who I work, I met at my first job. One of the things he was saying, because I at the time, I had kind of been thrown into active wear because it wasn't really what I decided to do at school, which I did not go to FIT, by the way. I went to University of Delaware. And when I left there, I was kind of just trying to find a job, not necessarily in a specific place, you know, in a specific type of job. Yeah. So I just kind of fell into, into active wear, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't conscious. But um, I remember talking to him one day and one of the things that he said was he really liked being in that because he's like, yeah, you know, the red carpet stuff is really cool. But he's like, I really love when you're walking down the street on a Saturday afternoon and you see somebody in your stuff. And he's like, that's the stuff that people are wearing every single day. And Mm -hmm. they don't have to, um, you know, tell the story behind it or they don't have to like be photographed in it. Like they chose to wear this on the day where they just felt like being comfortable. And I was mm-hmm. like, you know, you make a good point. <laughs> I was like, from then on, I started thinking about it a lot differently. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I would love to get back to what you were talking about in regards to like seeing what, you know, be, seeing what you made being on people. Like, I love that. Like to yeah. walk around and be like, I made that. I helped with that. Like, I know what that is. I named that one. Yeah. Um, it's my favorite. And I think when... When you make something and somebody chooses what you've made to be part of their self-expression and their pride and their confidence, mm-hmm. like nothing is cooler than that. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, for I mean, sure. there are pl- plenty of things that I have made that people like just box. They needed something. Mm. But then when you see people like rocking it and feeling good, you're like, yes. Like, yeah, yeah. That's exactly sure. why we made it. I'm so glad that you're getting it. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah. And especially the C9 product we had um, towards the end, I was working on outerwear. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, I was working on, we were also doing um, golf, like we did a lot of seasonal products. So we did like golf in the spring and then outerwear in the fall, which the outerwear was actually much more my favorite. 
But um, the Target people had started like, you know, it was like their private label brand and then the C9 stuff next to it. And it was so cool that we were always, you know, when you see somebody on the street and you're just like, there was a cheaper version sitting right next to that. And you <laughs> took the C9 one. <laughs> there's, a, there's a little bit of satisfaction in that. There's a lot of Completely. satisfaction in that. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> Completely. Like, I love it. I'm like, pat on the back, pat on the back, go team. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Something else I think that is so fascinating is when, you know, we talk about working in fashion. Most people say, like, fashion is all designers. And I'm like, no, there's so many amazing jobs <laughs> in, oh, yeah. in fashion that design is is one of them. It's a super important role. And if you love fashion and you're like, I'm not really a designer and that's not my jam, there's so many other roles to be in. Like, like none of it can exist without pattern people or tech engineers. Um, there's sourcing. If you love organizing, there's a role. Um, if you you know, like want to do more strategy or marketing, like every piece of a business is, is in fashion. And there's so many steps and people and tasks <laughs> to make it all come to life. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's interesting because they don't really talk about that in school. Mm-hmm. So when you get out of school, you kind of think, okay, I can be a designer or I can be a designer, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And yeah. I remember in the last couple of years talking to my students about, well, why don't you, you know, if you really like this, then why don't you try this? Like, I remember last, I don't know if it was last fall of the wall before that, but we have a, 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 there's a class that I teach where it's mostly about sketching mm-hmm. and teaching illustrator. And I remember one of the students saying that he didn't really like pattern making. He didn't really yes. like all the other stuff about designing except drawing. And I said to him, well, why don't you think about like going into trend or, you know, or something like that? I mean, there are illustrators who illustrate on the runway. But mm-hmm. if you're trying to get like a job that is kind of stable, I'm like, why don't you think, why don't you think about trend? And he was like, I didn't even know that was a job. I'm like, right. yeah, none of us didn't know we started working. <laughs> Yeah, but, or like even the fact that you can be only materials or only a specific material or colorist. just color. Uh huh. Like the number of hours I have spent arguing over like what shade of pink was appropriate is probably embarrassing. Like definitely not saving the world by choosing the right pink. Oh yeah, yeah. I've had those <laughs> conversations before, and it's like the the. the banter back and forth about, well, maybe it should be a little bit bluer. Maybe it should. I, and I'm not saying that this isn't an important conversation because it kind of harkens back to that scene in The Devil Wears Prada where she's just like, it's just all blue. I mean, it, oh, it you yeah. know, and it, it is important, like little things, little nuances like that. But for me, it kind of became really crazy because it was Target. It was C9. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, come on, y'all. It's like a $9.99 bra. Right. <laughs> you know, let's just, right. just pick a color for Pete's sake, you know. But, I mean, things like that are important. And, I mean, I have a friend who comes. She's come to speak at my class twice. She was a former designer, and her job now is in color. And mm-hmm. her job is to forecast the color, keep an eye on trends, keep an eye on what colors are trending, um, things like that, and help to put the palettes together here each season. And each time she comes to the class, each semester, everybody is amazed. And she even says, you know, I never knew that there was a job like this, but I love it, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, and um, we've taken the test. We, uh, I forget which job it was. We all had to take the test to see if we're people who can see more colors than others. Yes. It's like a, like what bees have. Mm-hmm. And I was like, so I was so excited that I scored that I did because it made <laughs> me mad. I'd be like, no, those, like, I'd be going back to the factor, like, these don't color match. They're like, yes, they do. I'm like, no, they don't. Mm-hmm. Like, they're off just to the point where it's annoying, where they like, mm, that looks like you guys messed up. Yeah. And it is, I do think that color is so important. I really believe in how color, you know, it influences us emotionally. It influences us in so many ways. It speaks uh, so many words because based on what we've applied to it culturally, which I think is also fascinating. Like what, how red can mean something different in different mm-hmm. cultures. 
Um, so I do think color is important. And I think when we get to some of the conversations you and I have both been in, when it is like which shade of turquoise is the right turquoise, Right. It's like, guys, let's just make a call. We know it's turquoise. We're not arguing, should it be green or orange? It's like, there's 55 chips in front of us. Like, pick one. We're all going to be happy with any of these right. chips. Right, right, right. Mm-hmm. Um, when you look back on eight-year-old self, um, was she dreaming of being a designer and teacher at FIT and, you know, creating um, all the things that you've created? Interestingly enough, kind of. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the things that was consistent was that I always wanted to do some sort of fashion thing. I also had mixed in there. I wanted to be a journalist because I like to write. I wanted to be a teacher. My parents were teachers and I was always like, I would have my dolls lined up in front of me and (laughs) my mom always said she would come in and I'd be like teaching a class. So it's interesting that now it's kind of come full circle. Mm -hmm. Um, Did I ever think I was going to be teaching at FIT? No, I wanted to, and they kept rejecting me for years. Um, So when they finally did call me or I got an email at like two in the morning, some weirdo, it was just out of the blue. And I was kind of like, what, huh? And by then (laughs) I had kind of like, you know how sometimes they say like you're, you're, pursuing something and pursuing something. And when you finally kind of just let go of it, mm-hmm. it sort of happens for you. I feel like that's how the FIT thing came because this was like maybe a year or two after I had been constantly like trying to get in and responding to every job posting yeah. that they had. And finally I was like, you know what? This is never going to happen. Just forget it. I'll just whatever. And sure enough, like a year later, I get this email from somebody that I know very well now. And I was like, is this for, and then I was like, is this for real? I don't think it's <laughs> like, because I hadn't even, by then I had stopped, you know, applying. And so I'm like, how do they even have my information? I'm like, I guess from the 20 resumes I sent from before, like they didn't but throw yeah. them in the garbage. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was it was interesting because it's it's always somehow revolved around fashion, but mm-hmm. it's kind of like gone back and forth about is she going to be a writer? Is she going to be a teacher? Is she going to be this? Is she going to be that? So it's kind of coming full circle now. And I'm excited that I have sort of created this space for myself because mm-hmm. I don't think even when I started teaching people about Adobe for fashion designers, it wasn't Mm -hmm. a thing. And now it's become more popular. There are more people in the space. Um, Yeah, I I would like to say that I'm the one who created it. I'm not going to go on record. I I don't know that officially, (laughs) but I'm just saying that when it started, I was one of the only ones doing it. (laughs) <laughs> may have been the first. Mm-hmm. May have, may have. <laughs> if if I could go back and do anything in my educational cur- like career, it would have been taking more graphic design and mm-hmm. more CAD work. Mm-hmm. Um, like I'm, um, it's one thing that I hate the fact that I don't have like the fluidity with it. Uh-huh. Like I can change colors. I can do a lot of it in Illustrator because I've had to as part of my job. Mm-hmm. But to create something from nothing in Illustrator for me is like painful. Usually I'm like <laughs> stealing parts of other things and like copy pasting things together to get where I want. Uh-huh. Um, so I wish I had more of that. And I know that um, just because it would be so much easier to communicate the ideas I have. Luckily, I, I keep finding people who um, are – amazing people that I can partner with that basically can read my mind and like I'm they can translate what's in my brain to to paper or screen Uh um but like for people who are listening like at least take some level of a graphic design class like it will open up so many opportunities for you and just make your life easier like if you're able to make your own logo or fix your own website or even just pick the right colors like I have a client right now that I'm helping with their um, uh, website, fixing mm-hmm. their website. Mm-hmm. And I ask them, like, what are their colors? And they're like, what do you mean? And yeah. I'm like, well, I, like, they didn't even know that colors meant something in marketing, that they could, like, 
pe- when people see graphic design and, and just design in general, it talks before you do. Right. And having to explain that process, like her mind melted, like, wait, what? I had no idea this even existed in the universe. I'm like, yeah, yes. yeah. Um, and I think that mm-hmm. especially with color, it's something that you, um, it's very emotional and you just respond to mm-hmm. it. So I think that people are already responding to it, but they don't really realize that they're doing yes. it, you know? Yeah, just like that, the blue conversation in Devil Wars Prada. Nobody knows how much they're being influenced mm-hmm. by all these choices that other people make. Right, And right. we just don't even think about it. Like, why is that your new favorite shirt? Why do you like this trend? Mm-hmm. Exactly. It's very exactly. fascinating. Yeah. Uh, we, I have, we have similar eight-year-olds because I was definitely doing school a lot and ripping things out of magazines and drawing and, like, had all the things. I'm like... I kind of had the same list of like what I wanted to do. Uh-huh. Like international journalist sounded awesome. Fashion designer sounded awesome. <laughs> teacher was like, I just liked that part. Like do what the teacher does. In particular, designing the classroom, which probably should be an indicator. <laughs> um, when you um, left, did you, at Delaware, did you study uh, art or design, fashion design in particular? Like what was the major there? I did. I studied apparel design and Mm -hmm. there at the time, I think their program was kind of small Mm -hmm. and it was interesting because most people, especially because I'm from New York, they assumed that I went to FIT, but I wanted to just get out of New York because I wanted to like be away for for college. Plus, Mm -hmm. you know, going to school in New York is a little bit different because it's like you're in the middle of the city. You don't necessarily have the same campus dormitory, Mm -hmm. you know, experience. So I wanted all of that. And my parents were from Delaware, or my father's from Delaware, my mother's from Pennsylvania, but they're they're pretty Mm -hmm. close. But they met at Delaware State University. And um, University of Delaware kind of popped up as a a place that had a fashion design program. And then Mm -hmm. my other thought was, you know, as I was saying before, I was sort of confused about what I wanted to do and where I wanted to go. So I knew that I didn't want to have to change schools. So University of Delaware was kind of the best option because if I did a year of fashion design and I'm like, eh, I don't really want to do this. I want to go back to like English or journalism or whatever. Mm -hmm. I could just move to a different major instead of having to go to a different school. Mm -hmm. So that there was a lot of thought that went into this. (laughs) Uh, but um, yeah, if they have an, they still have a really great apparel design program. Mm-hmm. And what was really interesting is they were very technologically advanced. So even mm-hmm. when I came out of school, my first job, this is going to probably blow a lot of people's minds. This is like in 97 when the internet was still new. So when I got out of school, my first job, we were still faxing things overseas, mm-hmm. like stacks of paper faxing stuff. And my supervisor one day said, ooh, we're going to get email. And I was like, yeah, I've been using email. (laughs) I was like, I used email in school. That's great. I was like, you know, I won't have to fax this crap anymore. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. So it was was that long ago. But um, but I felt like I had a, a little bit of an advantage. Interestingly, we talked a lot about Photoshop and not Mm -hmm. as much about Illustrator. And when Mm -hmm. I got to school, I realized that Illustrator was a little more uh, important to what I was doing every day than Photoshop was. But my supervisor was very impressed that I even had that background because Mm -hmm. a lot of the students that were coming out of FIT and they were coming out of Parsons hadn't even touched the computer. Yeah, I, I, um, I'm technically a fashion school dropout. I went after grad school. I went back to go, uh-huh. and then I got a job, and I'm like, I'm not going to any more school. <laughs> um, but even there, they didn't have any CAD programming. Like You had to go to um, one of the other schools to like, get those credits if you mm-hmm. wanted to. Yeah. And everything was by hand, patterns by hand, like illustrations by hand, like the whole thing. And mm-hmm. I was like, so... If you want it by hand, I'm your girl. If you want it by a computer, not your girl. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, University of Delaware was actually one of the last um, three schools I was choosing between. Um, really? 
Yeah, it was Delaware, Michigan, or the school I ended up going to, Clark University. Um, I just knew I wanted to play field hockey, and then I had like 500 majors I was interested in. So similar to you, I was like, where can I go where I have options? Um, <laughs> but the campus there is beautiful. Like, it's it's mm -hmm. um, it's a it's a full authentic kind of college experience with beautiful quads and the you know brick dormitories it's very oh, classic yeah. looking mm -hmm. yeah and i think they've added on to it i mean i haven't been there in years my mm -hmm. parents still live in delaware so every once in a while there'll be like a church meeting or some kind of function at university of delaware and my yeah. mom will drive through and she's like michael you have to go back and see the campus they added mm -hmm. on a new building and they did this and blah 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 so i mean it was great when i was leaving they were building stuff then and when I left, I was thinking, wow, this is a pretty nice campus. And now, yeah, it's, it, I'm sure it's just amazing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, in addition to all of your entrepreneurial endeavors and teaching and designing, um, you're also part of an entrepreneurial partnership in your relationship, right? Like you are with someone yes. who's also entrepreneurial. Yes, yes. He is a filmmaker. He actually has um, a series out on, and an, uh, this, uh, one episode of one newer series called Nights Over Egypt. And then he also has another comedy series called No Sleep Till 40. Um, and they're both on, on uh, YouTube and he's about to do kind of like their series, fin series finale over mm -hmm. Zoom which should be very interesting um, for No Sleep Till 40. So yeah, he's doing that. And then we are collaborating on something based on the um, event that I did last year. Mm -hmm. And it's really just how to take your designs and bring them to fruition. It's called From Pencil to Production. So he's going to do the production part of it. And we're planning that together. But it's, it's going to be a la uh, Project Runway type of thing. Mm -hmm. And we'll, we're figuring out how to do that on Zoom as well. <laughs> so that Amazing. should be interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we're going to do it as a contest. So it'll be, it'll be fun. I think it'll be also a way for us to kind of connect with newer designers as well mm -hmm. and kind mm -hmm. of help them to build better businesses. Because I think that was one of the things we talked about as well was yeah. that, um, Creative people are really great. The creative end is not the problem. It's the business part. And mm -hmm. so people talk about how creative businesses and fashion businesses fail within like their first year or two. Mm -hmm. And some of it is money, um, but a lot of it tangled up within that is mismanaging your business because you don't really know, you know, they know how to design a line, but they don't really understand how to run a business. Yeah, it's... Um you know, as we talked, it's one of the reasons why I focus on creative entrepreneurs, right? Mm -hmm. Like I have 20 years experience of doing the business side and working with the designers to make it happen. And there's so many solutions, right? Like knowing the practical stuff, finding the people who are great partners because they do what you don't want to do and vice versa. Exactly. Exactly. Um, there is. And, and I think something that impacts all entrepreneurs is knowing how to set up the order of operations so that you have cash flow, but yeah. also so that you have just enough of what you need to get to the prototype stage. Because every business, tangible or or intangible, does have a testing prototype stage. Right. And like, how do you figure out like what to do, where to wait, all those things. Like most people who are making tangible things, they don't actually make them or or buy production until they've they have cash in hand like a true futures program right and most i don't know many people outside of sportswear that even know what a futures program is right. even other business owners and right. for those listening who want the quick synopsis um nike did this in the 80s when they ran out of money and didn't know how to keep up with Reebok, who was taking over. Mm -hmm. So instead of fronting the money, they went out and convinced everyone to give them a deposit or buy it in full up front, and then they would deliver um, within six months. Like that was their futures-based model. You're buying for the future. And yeah. it revolutionized how people bought um, footwear and, and apparel because 
why would you ever spend your own money if you don't need to? Like it flipped everything. And nobody tells you that you can play games like that with cash flow. Like even in business school, like that's barely talked about, barely. It's like, go get someone else to give you money. And I'm like, what? I mean, it is a way to do it, but they usually talk about it from having investors or an angel Venture investor. Capital, or, yeah. Right. And it's like, no, like when it's a futures program, it's just people paying you. It's it's pre-selling, which is what people call it today. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. And I think that now is such a great time, particularly for fashion entrepreneurs, because yes. there's so much, I mean, I'm a technology person. So there's so much newer technology now that will allow you to do that kind of thing. And most people now are doing more on demand selling mm-hmm. or they're doing, um, you know, as you, you know, at, pretty much as uh, on demand, like as you, yeah. you buy it and then they make it. Yeah. And there is actually someone that I'm trying to partner with and we'll see what happens, but um, they're called Resonance. And basically what they're doing is they are allowing you to set up your fashion line. And I have to get more information about how they're actually doing this, but Mm -hmm. they're basically doing on-demand printing and you use natural fibers. Um, They, you know, once somebody actually orders something, then they print it, make Mm -hmm. it, ship it, you know, and get it out to the customer um, but not only that, but it also increases the sustainability of your company and you're only printing and making what you need. So you don't have to have products sitting in the warehouse, you know, taking mm-hmm. up space. And later on, when somebody decides they don't want it, selling it off, you know, so you're still, yes. you're getting some money, but you're still losing money. Um, and I also think that the 3D, which is what I'm, that's the next thing that I'm trying to move towards is Mm -hmm. also going to help with this as well, because there's a certain amount. I mean, we used to sell the C9 product line off of cats. Yep. And I mean, there's something to be said for that because one, I remember when I first came out of school, people said that they would never buy anything off paper. They had to see a sample. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, as early as I'm going to say five years ago, People got to the point, even in sportswear, even, Mm -hmm. you know, in Mm -hmm. that where people were okay with buying off of a paper sketch. As soon as they knew they could get it faster, Mm -hmm. they're like, I don't care. I want it now. So it could could save money. It could save some money, (laughs) you know, not having to create all these extra samples, right? Mm -hmm. So now with 3D, they kind of take it a little one step further because now your line sheets that you're showing to people are these three-dimensional things, or Mm -hmm. you can do it all digitally. You can have these virtual showrooms. Mm Mm-hmm. And it's almost as if you're not actually touching it, but I mean, you could send to body fabric, you know, yes. but you're watching it. One, there's the ooh-ah factor, right? Because you're yes. looking at it. 3D is still a new thing. So people are looking at it like, oh my God, that's so cool, you know? Mm-hmm. But then the other part of it is you really do get to see what the garment looks like and how it fits on an, on an avatar that, you know, is supposedly your fit model. Mm-hmm. And then you can also see, okay, what things are people responding to, what they're not responding to. So you're not making something that's going to eventually end up on the sale rack. You know, right? Like that. It's the biggest. The two biggest waste factors are um, extra inventory, like mm-hmm. in the wrong sizes or colors, mm-hmm. and then just making stuff that people don't want in general. Right. And and to tie this into something that's happening in real time now, like. When everyone's talking about how they can make a vaccine for COVID Mm -hmm. within like in the fastest timelines ever, Mm -hmm. many of the companies making the vaccine have said, we're upfronting the cost. We're just going to start production now Mm -hmm. in good faith that this vaccine is going to work and get approved. So they're spending millions of their own money to stockpile stuff that we don't actually know if it's going to work or we're going to need. But they're right. taking that risk because it can save time. Mm-hmm. And where, to your point, the fashion industry is going the completely opposite way. Where we're like, we're not making anything <laughs> until we know you actually want it. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Which I think is actually, because they can respond a lot faster than they used to, I think it's a smart mm-hmm. move. Um, and given 
some of the problems that people overseas now have. I mean, you've got all of these companies and factories and warehouses that have gone um, bankrupt yes. or they have, you know, families who own these things that can't feed their families because mm-hmm. they have all this inventory that people don't want because they're like, I can't sell it. Well, nobody's buying. Nobody's coming into the store. Um, so if it was more of an on-demand thing, then they would not be sitting with all this inventory and the stores would also not be feeling like, you know, I'm, I'm on the, I'm on the, uh, the hook. I, I, on the hook. Thank you. I'm mm-hmm. on the hook for all of this inventory and this money. Like I've got to pay this person all this money for all of this stuff that I can't do anything with. Yeah. No, there's, there's so many, um, opportunities in it. And I really think that you know, we're obviously talking a lot on the media about the industries that are impacted that people need on mm-hmm. a regular basis, but there's so many impacts to the fashion industry Yeah, between um, you can't travel to go meet with accounts, you can't, there's uh, runway shows aren't happening. To your point, like factories are being shut down. Mm-hmm. Um, we can't, um, all the import export rules are changing every day yes. based oh, on- gosh. Like what's happening? Who it is? Like it, there's never been more turmoil from in my experience with the industry than there is today. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a client who I've been helping who's starting a new apparel business, and we had the factory picked out. We had the fabric. Everything was good to go. It was going through testing. It's a very technical product, so we had fabric going through testing here in the U.S. And then COVID hit. The factory went dark because obviously they were all stuck at home and he as a new business was like the least of their concerns. Right. And when they did come back, they said, we have to streamline. We can't work with you anymore. Wow. And so he then had to scramble, find another factory. They even had an issue. He went from China to Vietnam. There's a problem there too. Like it's now this huge headache. Like it's adding a year of launch time to the whole process. Yeah. And you know, this is not just happening to new startup companies that have right. less leverage. You know, um, the companies who have gone vertical, like Nike or, or Adidas, they're definitely going to be in better shape than mm-hmm. others that aren't vertical, where they don't own their own factories and things like that. But it's still like flipping everything on its head. Everything. It um, is. It so I just see an opportunity for any entrepreneur that can be creative and nimble and flexible. Um everything has to go that way. Like yes. there's, and so things might cost more because of that. Um, and I think to your point, like creating on demand, printing on demand, 3D opportunities, a lot of that is we're going to see, I think even more of it than we, it was, it's going to be accelerated at like a whole nother level. Oh yeah, for mm-hmm. sure. For sure. But, but it's, and on the, on the one hand, it's, it's kind of scary, you mm-hmm. know, because Almost everything I think that we have known about how the fashion industry operates is pretty much going to be out the door. (laughs) Yes. But it leaves room for new new ways of doing things, um, new thinkers, innovation. It leaves room for all that to just come in and say, hey, we have to do this differently. Whereas I think... People have been saying we have to do things differently for a while, but because we didn't really have to change, Mm -hmm. you know, there's no reason for anybody to do anything differently, you know? Yeah. Now you have to, you know, Mm -hmm. like you're either going to do differently or you're not going to make it. (laughs) So it's like, okay, now's our opportunity to really get in there and say, okay, let's do something different. Let's do something revolutionary, something that mm-hmm. actually works, something that's good for the planet. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's something that actually makes sense for the people who are working mm-hmm. on it, as well as the, um, the customer, you know, I mean, yes. buying things, buying coats. I remember reading something where this person, someone was like buying coats in August. It does not make sense. And no. I was like, oh, yeah, I'm so glad it doesn't. You bring this up. <laughs> I'm so glad you brought this up because like it irritates me to no end that the shopping cycle because of essentially greed as the primary factor Mm -hmm. kept pulling back and back and back. Like 
exactly to what you're saying. Why were we shipping clothes you need in winter in July? Right. Right. Why? Like, we don't need to give people 10 weeks to buy winter clothes. People are going to buy it when they need it, and then that's it. And then people are getting savvy where they're like, well, I'll just buy my coats in January when they all go on sale. When they all go on sale, yeah. So we have this crazy cycle happening of making too much all the time. Mm -hmm. Too early, too much, too big. Um, My my predictions from a a trend perspective with what you're going to see is that people are going to start offering it's going to go back to classics in less colors and less materials. Like we're gonna, really going to streamline what a lot of is, is available. Mm-hmm. Like you're going to you're going to have less options. Like you're going to have your leggings in five colors, not twenty. Yeah, and I, I think there's going to be a consolidation in like reoccurring basics. And then I think on the other side, to your point, you're going to see a lot of independent brands, and then you're going to see a lot of just of extreme design. Like like you're going to have the polar opposites. I think showing up because yeah. There's always the rebellion. And I think that a lot of the existing established brands are going to have to narrow their focus. Like, um, are you familiar with the Pareto's, like the 80-20 Pareto's curve? Uh, I feel like I've heard of it. I'm sure you have. (laughs) Yeah. So essentially, like when you're merchandising or selling anything, like 20% of what you make is um, what actually brings you 80% of your income. And this applies to everything, Mm to-do lists, uh, how we spend our money, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So when you're merchandising a line and analyzing SKUs, you look at like, where's your curve? Where's your Pareto's curve hit? Mm -hmm. And usually you can cut off 80% of your line because you don't need it. And so what I see happening is people dialing in that curve more where they're like, all right, I'm going to make this stuff we need and then we can play with 20% of what we want to do. I think you're going to see more of that. 80% standard basics and then 20% fun for the people Mm -hmm. who are bigger. Yeah. And I think all the new people are going to kind of fall into, like the independents will fall into those spaces too. Like, are you a basic independent or are you an extreme? (laughs) Um, It happens now a little bit, but I think it's really going to be, that's where the pressure is going to be. There's not going to be any wiggle room for. Yeah for spending or risk because everyone is eating it in some capacity right now. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I do think though that the smaller businesses, because they are a little bit more nimble and a a little bit more flexible, they have the the opportunity to be a little more flexible, um, can maybe experiment with more creative things. And I think that's what's going to happen. Like you're going to go to your bigger stores for your basic stuff. And then go to your smaller designers if you if you're looking for something interesting and different. Yes. You want to stand out from everybody else, you know. And yep. it might be a little bit more expensive, but you know that's going to be your statement piece yes. with the rest of your basics. <laughs> yes, yeah. And honestly, that type of of fashion and style and buying process, like it makes me excited. It's it's honestly the way that. Uh, the European trends have been for a long time of Mm -hmm. like how people actually buy. And I think that there's so much more power in that, right? Between the the overlapping of minimalism that's been happening anyway, and Mm -hmm. then COVID and then the economy, it's like, well, yeah, you're not seeing people with like the share closet from Clueless is like not going to be normal. (laughs) Right, right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Especially when you're home all the time and you're on Zoom meetings. We're going to have like right. really cool tops and a bunch like, of leggings. Yes. <laughs> or denim shorts, as I'm wearing today. <laughs> Business on top, you know, casual on the bottom. Exactly. Or jeans. Or jeans. Yep. Yes. Yep. Yeah. It's like the mullet. Zoom is creating the mullet of fashion. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, when we look at, you know, when you think about powerful ladies, mm-hmm. what do those two words, powerful and ladies, mean separately? And what do they mean combined to you? Powerful, I think, to me, represents um, not just physical strength, but also mostly emotional strength Mm -hmm. Um, to move yourself and propel yourself forward, to move your business forward, to just move everything about your life, move your life forward. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, ladies would be um, ladies, women, (laughs) female, female power. Um, and then powerful ladies, I feel like is, um, 
women, women who are, I want to say strong, but I want to use a different word. I guess, I guess strong. Um, women who are, who have the strength to propel their life forward and also help their community, whether that is other women, men, family, whoever, but whoever is part mm-hmm. of that community can help to move lives, improve lives and help all of us move forward together. Yeah. It's, I mean, that's beautiful. Um, <laughs> We had the pleasure of having you on our first um, A Powerful Conversation About America Racism Episode 1, mm-hmm. and I'm honored that you're going to be on Episode 2. Um, you know, as a powerful lady, how have you been managing all that's going on in the world? And again, I'm talking about all the layers of everything. Um, what has come up for you? How have you been navigating it? And, you know, what would you tell people who are navigating it right alongside with you? I think that one of the things I've been trying to focus on is how can I make a difference in my life, in the Mm -hmm. lives of others every day? And even if you're just focusing on one person, whether it is that you're talking to your children or you're talking to your friend or, you know, you're putting, a lot of people don't like to post on Instagram. That's fine. Mm -hmm. I think that having the conversations and being aware of what's going on just person to person is actually the most important because, yeah. you know, people kind of feel like, well, how are you going to make a difference when there's so many people, there's so much yeah. one person at a time is enough, yeah. you know? Yeah. So if you can speak to, if, you know, if you can't do it every day, do it once a week, like just commit mm-hmm. to, you know, doing something once a week, to become a better, you know, try to become a better human, Mm -hmm. try to help somebody else become a better human. Maybe it's just you explaining why what they said is really nasty, you know, Mm -hmm. or wearing a mask, (laughs) you know, like all those things matter. And all of those things um, add up to us moving forward together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we were talking about the mask, wearing masks or not, and like how people feel about it. And I'm like, well, you know, I know that people fought wearing seatbelts when they were first required. And now you wouldn't think twice about, right. like, it's culturally, it's weird if someone doesn't wear a seatbelt. And right. fact, like, even kids are like, wear your seatbelt, right? Because <laughs> they tell you. And I'm like, it's, is it any different than that? Is it different than, like, I love the meme where they're showing people wearing underwear. Mm-hmm. And, and like... <laughs> You put your underwear on, so like just put your mask on. Like it would be weird if you didn't. Yeah. Um, and I understand that, you know, I want people to feel, I don't want people to feel like their freedoms are being taken away, but I think that that's how do we shift the perspective of like it's actually an opportunity. Like when I got sick and I had to get tested and I um, you know, thankfully it was negative, you know, I stayed at home. Not because I felt so horrible that I couldn't leave, but I was like, I can't risk giving this to somebody else. Like, I don't want to be the reason that someone else, like, gets horribly sick or, yeah. God forbid, like, dies. So I'm going to take responsibility to be like, okay, I can stay home and quarantine. And when I am feeling better and it does still come back negative, I can still wear a mask because wearing a mask is ultimately for somebody else. It's not for me. Right. Right. And it's like, it's so, you know, if you love people, like wear a mask. <laughs> I think that that is the biggest thing is trying to uh, shape the narrative about wearing a mm-hmm. mask and have it be that you are trying to help not only protect yourself, like you, mm-hmm. you're protecting your fellow man. And that person who is out there wearing a mask is helping you and you're helping them. You know, yeah. and if we can, if we can all get behind that, um, whether even if it's about, OK, you wouldn't want me breathing on your mom, right. <laughs> you know, or you know what I mean? Like, yeah. think about it as I am part of your family or I may come in contact with your family. And the last mm-hmm. thing you want is for me to unknowingly because, you know, I mean, we all know that 
people could have any kind you know, people could have COVID and not have symptoms. So, and not everybody's tested, you know? Right. Um, so it is to all of our advantages. And if you don't want to think about me, unfortunately, um, you know, or the person on the street and you're just like, whatever, think about mm-hmm. that person on the street coming in contact with your sister, your mother, mm-hmm. your brother, whoever, you know, mm-hmm. and if you, if you can think about, you know, if you can think about that, that may help kind of shift the narrative. Oh yeah. I should probably put that mask on because mm-hmm. I want that same consideration for that some to, to for somebody else to have that same consideration for my me and for my family. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, when you look at how things are transforming, do you feel that things are moving forward at all? Like, do you feel hopeful, or do you feel like um, we've gone backwards? Like, how do you feel humanity? How would you score humanity right now? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think humanity is moving forward. I think that sometimes we get caught up in the negativity that people are posting. And Mm -hmm. I always go back to a few weeks ago. Actually, I guess it's about a month ago, at least a month ago. Now I watched, um, Michelle Obama's becoming. Mm -hmm. And one Mm -hmm. of the things I remember her saying, and this may have been in the book too, because I finally finished her book, which was great. Yes, it's um, really good. It was awesome. Um, but one of the things that she was saying was to keep in mind that there are more people in the world, in the country, that really are interested in finding the things that are the same about us and understanding yes. mm-hmm. than kind of wanting to shun you and f- focus on the differences. Yes. And so when I see things that are upsetting. Mm -hmm. I try to remember that because Mm -hmm. I also try to remember that news is a business just like any other TV shows and film. Like, you know, you're not thinking of it that way, but the news is there. They need to have an audience. So Mm -hmm. one of the quickest ways to get an audience is to put something on the news that is shocking you yeah, know, it, sensationalize it. it. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. The good stuff and the fun stuff, like things that come on Tanks Good News and Upworthy yeah. and some of those other, you know, feel good places, um, that's not making the evening news, you know? No. So yeah. if you're watching that and you're only watching that and that, or that's all you're looking for, you're going to feel like humanity sucks. Everybody mm-hmm. sucks. Nobody cares about anybody else. Blah, blah, blah. But I know better because I'm looking for things that are more hopeful. You know, I'm looking at, I'm trying to build with other people that are hopeful, that are saying, Mm -hmm. I want to understand, you know, I want to try and do something different. I want to try and write some of these things that are happening. You know, Mm -hmm. I'm not interested in what's going on right now. I don't think that it's good. Mm -hmm. So how can I work with you to make it better? You know, so I think that if you are just looking on the surface, you would feel like humanity is at from on the scale of zero to 10, you know, Mm -hmm. 10 being the best. Humanity is probably closer to zero. Mm -hmm. But if you dig deeper and realize that there are more people who want to be be better, who are looking for a better America, who are looking for a better world then it's much closer to 10 than, yeah. you know, than you originally thought if you're just looking at the evening news. Do we have work to do? We have a lot of work mm-hmm. to do. Mm-hmm. But the great thing is that this is the first time that, and I was having this conversation with my husband, I think this is the first time that we've felt like there are more people willing who are really, you know, to, to use the phrase that has been, overly used, (laughs) but woke. (laughs) Um, But in the sense of, okay, I'm seeing it. I see it now. I understand what you've said. You know, I understand what you've been saying. You're not crazy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I hear you, you know, and that's really nice. And that wasn't always happening, you know, so it feels different. Yeah, I agree. Um, You know, it's, 
part of the reason why I love traveling is that you realize how alike humans are everywhere. Mm -hmm. And we actually share so many things in common. And we, at the end of the day, like we list our priorities. Most humans list the same priorities, right? It's it's, um, you know, feeling mm-hmm. like you have purpose, it's family, it's friends, it's connections, it's good food. It's like all these things. Um, it's all the things that we, you know, care about at the, at the, uh, most days. Yeah. And it's, I seriously think that the U S in particular needs to start doing some internal PR mm-hmm. about what does it mean to really be American based on what Americans actually feel like most Americans want to be able to, you know, just like it says, like the pursuit of happiness. And we want to be able to, you know, be safe and feel protected and get an education and go after our dreams and take care of our families. Like there's so many things that we really care about that I think even in the, in the, in, in politics get swept under the rug for things that don't actually impact people on a daily basis. Right. And I'm like, why, like, not that those topics are important, right. um, but have we taken care, just like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, have we taken care of the basics for people? Right. And, right. you know, when you see the numbers of like, which communities are impacted, even just by COVID more. Like, no one's surprised because there's been, you know, flags waving like, hey, um, we have health issues in general, like access to whole foods and access to hospitals and access to... Access, period. In general. Mm -hmm. And, And how, you know, it's like, so it's no surprise that people with less access are being impacted by things more. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's just, I'm... I'm glad to be going through this period of seeing more people realizing that they can't be on cruise control Mm -hmm. and that they have to be active. Um, And there's so much opportunity just like civics lessons (laughs) and like how this, you know, you can change the system when you know how it works. When you don't know how it works, it's really hard to change it. Um, There's, there's a great video. I'll have to find it and post it again that Jennifer Lawrence had made with a, um, political science um, professor and educator. Mm-hmm. And it was all about how um, local elections are so much more uh, important than, yeah. than um, federal elections, which sounds crazy because we don't, in how media talks about it, it's in reverse. Mm-hmm. Um, but like you said, like, how do you start with whoever is next to you? How do you start in your house, in your neighborhood, in your, in your community, in your city? And there's even studies that show, like, why did different laws get passed? Like, when so many states say yes, it, it automatically passes at the federal level. Yeah. And so it, it's a lot easier also to participate locally than, as you said, in, like, this huge big thing. Like, we have to fix it all. This is so overwhelming. I'm just going to start drinking. <laughs> like, that's, <laughs> that's not where we want people going, right? Um, so I'm I'm really curious to see um, how it shifts, right? Like how, like what are people going to do? And that's why I'm excited to continue these special conversations we're having through Powerful Ladies, and even to be having one in October, very close to the election. Like we're mm-hmm. intentionally, I put it there on purpose because I want people to remember, like just what cares about that, what they care about. Like yeah, please take action. Um, I saw a statistic that there are more women and minorities um, unregistered to vote than all of who voted in the last election. Wow. And I'm like, uh, unfortunate, but not surprising. Right, right. It's like, you know, it's so people said they want to have purpose and take action. And that's like, you can do that online. Like, (laughs) yeah, yeah. But I, Mm -hmm. you know, it's. It's hard because I also identify with Mm -hmm. a younger generation that's like, this system isn't working. We just need to blow it up. Mm -hmm. I I get it. 
I get yeah. it, you know, but at the same time, so at, but at this, at the same time that you're protesting, you also need to work within the structure that is there so that while you are trying to make these changes to the structure that we know is not working, mm-hmm. um, we need to figure out, okay, you need to, you need to have somebody there who put somebody in place who can help you figure mm-hmm. out what this new structure is going to be. Because yes. just having no structure at all can cause as much damage and chaos yeah. yes. as having a structure that's not working, you know? Yes. There's, there needs to be something there. Mm-hmm. And while I am totally on board with what's there now that is not working, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I also understand that we need to be able to, to work within the structure that we have. Yeah. And then slowly have those people figure out how to chip away, you know, mm-hmm. where all of us are working together and chipping away and saying, okay, we're getting rid of this, we're getting rid of this, and we're putting this in place, you know? Yeah. No, I totally agree. It's, um, you know, even if we if we look at uh, healthcare, right, mm-hmm. um, if there's so much controversy about it, but when you ask people, should we take care of people, they say, most of the time they say yes. Mm-hmm. And who they, and I think a mistake that may have been made in the initial, we went from like zero to hero, right? With mm-hmm. healthcare. And I think that's what's causing people the rub. And yeah. I, like in hindsight, I, my recommendation would have been, what does it look like to give children and elderly free this healthcare and like let grown up slowly come into it? Because yeah. I agree. Nobody says we shouldn't take care of kids and nobody says we shouldn't take care of old people, right? Like, right. Okay, let's start with what we agree on. Let's prove that it works and then let's get into the into the gray zone right. or the it looks divisive zone. Um, and I also think there's a whole angle that no one's talking about specifically about the healthcare piece of how not having access to healthcare, affordable healthcare is a huge limitation to entrepreneurship. And yeah. to me, that would be, that sounds like it could be an argument on the conservative side of what what type of healthcare system we need so that people can be capitalists and be in business and, and you know, support the small business angle. Um, how does that happen? Because right now all the burden's on, it's on the small business. So there's so, I, I just don't understand why we have to make it so complicated when like it's, it occurs to me that the complication is in media and in a very small group of people, it's yeah. not in the majority. And that's the part where I'm like looking around and being like, when I stop watching the news and I'm in my neighborhood, we aren't having all this drama. So Right. If the neighborhood's okay, and we have people in the neighborhood who have Trump flags and Biden flags and Green Party, like every, like I'm impressed that like everyone's like waving high, even though their bumper stickers are completely different. Right, right. So if we can do it in this block, I have confidence we can do it at a bigger scale. It's also why I wasn't surprised that Des Moines, Iowa, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. implemented changes so quickly because they're a small city. They yeah. had less people to have to have a conversation together. Um, so, you know, coming full circle to starting small, right? Whether it is educating people or changing the system or any of that, have the grand yeah. idea, but check off the small boxes first because that's where you're going to get momentum. It's the same for business. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. You're, if your goal is we're going to make a million dollars year one, that's going to be real painful. <laughs> Yeah. So when you um, look at your, yourself as a multipreneur mm-hmm. and, you know, where you're going, if you could give yourself, you know, 20-year-old self some tips, what would you tell her specifically about the business journey? Um, I would tell her to save a lot more money mm-hmm. <laughs> and to uh, travel more now because despite not even taking into consideration COVID, but, Mm -hmm. you know, just now when I'm really, really grinding on my business, um, you know, travel is kind of out of the window, 
but also to think more about what the end game is going to be and what the big picture Mm -hmm. is going to be. Because I think that for a lot of us, we sort of move into these things and we're like, okay, I want to run a business. And that's great, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. and you understand that you don't want to work for someone else. You want to work for yourself. You're passionate about what this is. All of that is wonderful. Yeah. But I don't think enough of us start with the end in mind. I I know I didn't. I just was like, I'm done. I'm getting out of here. I can do something else. Yeah. But now thinking about it, okay, what is your end game that you want for your business? Do you want to sell it? Do you want to continue to run it in the next few years? Do you want to bequeath it, you know, to your kids? Do you Mm -hmm. want to... um, sell it to a partner, like, you know, sell, do you want to take it public? And yep. you, when you think about those types of things, you run your business differently. And so I was just kind of doing stuff, you know, like I was, I was just doing it. I mean, now I'm thinking about it much more and mm-hmm. thinking about, okay, what's the end game? How, what kind of structures can I put into place? What am I telling people about it? But at mm-hmm. that time I was really, um, you know, I was just doing it. And I mean, 20, you know, you yeah. just, you just having a good time, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. So I think that w- in between the parties and whatever else I was doing at that time, mm-hmm. I would pay a little bit more attention to, to that, to mm-hmm. um, exactly where I'm trying to go and what I'm trying to do when I'm 30, when I'm 40, when I'm 50, you know, have mm-hmm. more p- plan, mm-hmm. have more of a plan. Yeah. Um, along your way, who are some of the powerful ladies or humans in general that have supported you and opened doors that um, really changed the game for you? The first person would definitely be my mom. Mm-hmm. And I, th- I think both of my parents. I think my mom was more in my corner a little bit more only because my father is very traditional in the sense of he um, was very big on saying, well, if I had boys, you know, was, there was three, there were three girls. Mm-hmm. So he's like, well, I would feel differently about this if you were a boy. And it's not to say that he didn't love us the same, that he, you know, but he was, he worried a lot more because we were girls. Yeah. Whereas my mom was always like, that'll be fine. Yeah. They, they know how to take care of themselves, you know. And so when yeah. I first told my parents that I'm quitting my job and I want to just freelance and I'm, mm-hmm. you know, putting this this business together, my mom was like, okay, all right, well, if you need anything, let's know. And my dad was like, what are you going to do for money? What are you going to do? for?" And I'm like, calm down. I've thought about this, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. So my mom definitely, and even now when I tell her, you know, here's what happened and, you know, this is kind of crazy and blah, blah, blah. You know, her first, bo- for both of them, their first thing is like, are you okay? I'm fine. Yeah. And my mom is like, all right, that's got, that's great. But my mm-hmm. dad is the one who starts with all the questions about worrying about things, you know, yeah. when my mom is like, and then my mom, you know, eventually just is like, don't worry about it. She can handle it, you know? <laughs> um, so she, she's always kind of like, you know, been my A1 as far as like having faith in everything that I did. And then yeah. my sister has always been the same way, you know, and she has also been the person like when I talk about, well, this, you know, such and such didn't pay me or something went bad. And she's like, well, you need to tell them that blah, 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 that this happened. And, blah, you know, she's like the person who's also in your corner and is like, go up there, defend yourself, you know. Yeah. So she she definitely is always in my corner. And then I had a woman um, that I worked with for a long time. And I actually talked to her um, about last week, I think. Um, and she left Haynes, I think like last year. Mm-hmm. But we had been working together for a very long time. I met her when I first started freelancing. And somehow we just worked, we really just worked w- really well together. Mm -hmm. And that was at least 10 or 15 years. Like she would go someplace and they would be like, we need a freelancer for blah, blah. She's like, I know just the person. 
You know, yeah. so she was always the person who kind of helped mm-hmm. me find the next gig and the next gig and the next gig. And then when I was telling her about all the other things that I was doing, she's like, yeah, that sounds amazing. You can do that. You know, she was like, oh, yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. So she's all she's always awesome. And probably the before last you, person. Oh, before you go on with that mm-hmm. person, how um, how did you guys connect and how did you create that relationship where you have this person that's like a yes to you and like she, you're the first person she's calling when she has a job? Because like I have people who are that for me and then mm-hmm. I know that, that I am that for some other people. And uh, I think people who are like yearning for a mentor or this person who has their back, it's like, how did you create that? So I'd love to know how you guys created that. Um. I think that we just had a similar type of work ethic. Mm-hmm. You know, she was a very hard worker. She was always one of those people that was there late. And no matter what she gave me to do, I was always like, yeah, I can do that. Mm-hmm. Even if I was walking away and thinking, how the hell am I going to do this? <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. But I, I always was like, yes, we can do this. So Mm-hmm. She was always very happy to, and then we we also, like, when she said something, I would give her my honest opinion. She was yeah. always very happy to hear it. And, you know, not that I was trying to be condescending or anything, but if I didn't like it, I was like, mm, I don't know about that, yeah. <laughs> you know? And yeah. she never took any of that personally. She always felt like, okay, she's giving her honest opinion. That's mm-hmm. great. That's what I need. And so our personality, we're also the same sign. We found out later on, but we just, (laughs) we worked really well together. Like we just had very, very good. um, We just had a very, a really great working relationship and it's hard to find other people that you work really well with. Mm -hmm. So whenever she, and could do certain things, like I think I was also one of the few freelance um, designers that, was happy to just be doing CAD work, put on my headphones and do CAD work. But if yeah. she needed a design, um, you know, another design eye, she knew that she could come to me. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. just various things. Like I was always up for the challenge. So, yeah. you know, when she brought things, she was like, do you think you could do this? And I'm like, yeah, I can do that, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I, I think both of us, and then she, one of the things I was interviewing her last week and she was talking about how she really, really loves to learn. And mm-hmm. I love to learn. So I think Me we bonded too. that way as well. Mm-hmm. It was kind of like that same mindset. And, yeah. you know, so whenever she needed someone who, you know, could come and help her on whatever, she was like, I would like you to come because I know we can work well together. You know, I've worked with you before. And eventually it became the kind of thing where I'm like, I know what she wants. This thing, you know, when we had a group of yes. people, I'm like, I already know she does not want that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, trust me, I've worked with yeah. her for at least five years. She's not gonna mm-hmm. go for this, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So it was it was helpful to have that rapport. And the longer our relationship went on, mm-hmm. the better it became, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think to recap, so if people want like a checklist for what that would be, and it's very similar to my experience too, mm-hmm. of you find someone that you like mutual respect about your work ethic. Yeah. Mutual respect about also probably like why you're doing it and like your the growth that you're looking for in yourselves and your career and what's next. Mm-hmm. Um, the fact so like you if you know that they work hard, if you know that you respect them as a human, and then if you can have like a really fun time working together, which is not just like, oh, we can go to work and we can go to happy hour. It's like, no, it's like you have fun solving the problem together. You have, you're both bringing equal contribution to it. Yes. It's so different. Like I love working with people where I'm like, when we're working together, it's not two brains. It's like four, like all of a sudden, like the ideas go back and forth and you feel there's like a playfulness in, in doing the work and creating Mm -hmm. where you get so excited. You're like high-fiving you're like, you're like gliding through the rest of the day. Cause we're like, that's how work should feel. Exactly. Um, exactly. And so, yeah, I, I'm so, it makes me happy that when other people talk about their people that way, because um, those are my, not just my favorite people at work, but my favorite people in life. Like, oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I also, my, my last but not least person is my yes. husband. 
Mm-hmm. And um, he is like president of my fan club. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and I really think it's not it's not just because he's my husband. Like we mm-hmm. really he like he really is proud of the things that I do. He really likes what I do. And now that we've been able to connect, Mm -hmm. we really do have a good time together. And I was always like, "Uh," you know, you don't, you, people get really kind of funny about connecting business and their relationships, because Mm -hmm. if somebody doesn't like something or, you know, things don't go well, um, I have not had that experience. Like we Mm -hmm. have a good time together. He's very funny. That's part of it. And then he tries to make everything really fun. Mm -hmm. So we just have a really good time together. And I also like that um, he is coming from a different industry. So it's almost like someone from, sometimes you want somebody who's outside of what you're doing to listen because they can kind of have a fresh perspective about what you're doing Mm -hmm. and And the thing that, you know, like when you're sitting with it too long, sometimes you just can't see something that's right in front of your face. And so, (laughs) yeah. And so he, I mean, we've had many conversations where he, you know, I'm babbling on and on about what's wrong. And he's like, why don't you just do blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, we have a lot of those conversations. Yes, yes. But um but yeah, I mean it's 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 really great. And I don't think that I've ever had such a strong outside of my family, I don't think I've mm-hmm. ever had such a strong support system and someone who is not only supportive but very excited, you know, about yeah. what you're doing. Like, oh my gosh, you get to, you know, do whatever today, you know, so in those days when I'm like getting up early. I'm getting mm-hmm. online. I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> you know, I'm like, I really do love teaching. Just not eight in the morning. And he's all right. Come on. Come on. Let's high five. Yeah. You know, <laughs> so it's, it's great. It's really great. Mm-hmm. I love that. I'm totally obsessed with power couples. Um, <laughs> being someone who's like ripped things out of magazines since I ever had a magazine, um, I always would take stories of like couples working together, especially creative couples. Mm-hmm. So I think there's so there's something so beautiful about finding that business creative flow and the brainstorm and like one of my lo- love languages is creating together. Like it mm-hmm. absolutely is. Like I know that I fall in love with people when we make things together. And when we, like, when you're building something together, mm-hmm. that's, that to me is love. It's like, you're building what's next or something new. Right. And so whenever I see couples that do that, like, I think it's, um, I just get so excited. I have like new superheroes. Yeah. And even on a non, like, uh, non-love relationship or romantic relationship, you know, I have a couple of clients who didn't want to hire their you know, best friend or their cousin or somebody to be on their team because like, oh, it's family. What if it gets weird? And I'm like, okay. Or what if like you can have the most incredible business ever because your best friend is in the business or your cousin is in the business that you already, you already do all these other things together. So why not create it from like, you know, put the things in place where it's safe and you're all protected and you know the rules, but why would you say no to like a level 10 option versus like picking someone, you know, is second best. Like, right. Right. Um, I think that sometimes people also think you're just pulling your family in or just pulling your friend in. And I'm like, no, I'm pulling somebody in who knows mm -hmm. how to do this particular thing and they know how to do it. Well, they just happen to be a really good friend of mine, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. It's, it's not nepotism where you're just giving someone a job because they're connected to you. Exactly. Like, no, like I happen to know some badass people. You're welcome. Like, <laughs> right. <yeah>. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, so for all um, the people listening who are, um, you know, now daydreaming of their idyllic life of working at uh, FIT and freelance designing and doing all these other amazing projects and educating people and having a you know, power couple relationship, um, what advice would you give them? Um, one, just go for it. Mm-hmm. You know, don't let anything that's happening right now keep you from continuing to have that dream and continuing to just go for it. Because despite what you might be seeing, 
Um, there are people who are starting businesses, who are mm-hmm. making money, who are connecting with people who are eventually, you know, become going to become their partners. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, just go for it. Um, just do it. Like Nike says, <laughs> yes. like the Nike slogan, just do it. Um, yeah. and, and just start, just mm-hmm. start starting. I've always said that starting is probably the hardest thing because people are sort of yep. thinking about, well, what if, what if, what, what if it goes, you know, what if it doesn't go well? Well, what if it does? You know, Mm -hmm. what is your life going to be like then? Let's focus on how great things are going to become, you know, focus on that and stay, you know, stay focused on that and um, just start. Yeah. And and I think changing that mindset perspective from what if is even better than I imagined. Mm -hmm. It, It Like there's freedom in that. And there's so much power in that. Like when you see how amazing it could be and that's why you're waking up early and that's why you're doing these things and that's why you're solving a problem at 2 a.m that you didn't know was going to come up like it changes the drive and the and the hustle it also changes how you share and you know when you're excited about like oh i'm doing this because i'm gonna go here Mm -hmm. other people get excited too like it's way easier to get support if you're excited about your why yeah. Then if you're like, oh, I hope this works. I don't know what's going on. Will you help me? And I'm like, no, why would I help you? That sounds horrible. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, I, I tell my students all the time, even when they make their presentations, I'm like, mm-hmm. okay, so we're all buyers and you're selling us and you have to act like your line is the shit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like for I, I don't always like how Kanye acts, but, you know, be Kanye for your presentation and come in here yes. And sell all of us why on why mm-hmm. we should buy this. And mm-hmm. if you're not excited about it, why the hell are we going to get excited about it? You know, like yeah. no amount of anything mm-hmm. is going to help if you're not coming up there. You're saying, guess what, y'all? I just came up with the best thing, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, it, it's it's an absolute game changer. Mm-hmm. And you know, if, if that means you have to be a little bit of like fake it till you make it and even believing that it's possible, like go for it. Yeah. For go sure. for it. For you know, sure. like if you, sometimes we have to sell ourselves first before we can sell anybody else. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's like, there's so many great ideas out there. There's so many amazing designs and, um, I don't know. I want to see more. I want more people who want to create things creating because that's, that's the fun part of life for sure. It is. Yeah. It mm-hmm. definitely is. And I want to be able to buy more creative things because I feel yes. like for a while it's kind of like it was a whole lot of really, really creative people. And mm-hmm. then all of a sudden, like to your point about uh, bigger companies going back to basics, they're mm-hmm. kind of already there. Like mm-hmm. now when mm-hmm. I go out shopping, I'm kind of like, I don't want any of this crap. <laughs> you know, so I when I, so I find people shopping. on mm-hmm. Instagram and I'm just like, Oh, that's so cool, yeah. <laughs> you know. So yes. this is the time. This is the time to do it. Like, just go for it. Yeah, I've been waiting for like the coolest thing I've seen come out in probably ten years mm-hmm. was when Gucci released their whole line with the animals on it, like the tigers and like they just started putting crazy. Like I'm like, I don't know where all this came from, but this is really <laughs> exciting. <laughs> And I'm like, I want, how do I buy the whole collection? Um, because I want, now I want tigers on all of my things, speaking of like tigers today. But um, <laughs> no, there's like such a, there's a huge missing in um, fashion that is more fun. Mm-hmm. Like where's, where's that blend of like, I can keep this forever and it's quirky and it still works with things. And I miss that. Like there's, I, being someone who used to be a clothes horse, I now have like a wardrobe of like 30 items because there's nothing I'm seeing that I'm like, I have to buy that. O- right. Or if I do, it's like $5,000. And I'm like, hmm, maybe I have to wait on that one. <laughs> but <laughs> So I would encourage, yeah, as you're saying, get out there and make it because people like you and I are like, please, like, where is it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Some kind of top so I can look cool on my Zoom meetings. <laughs> <laughs> so as we're wrapping up today, um, is there any other advice or a favorite quote or, you know, pro tips that you have that you would love to share with everyone listening? 
Um, I would say to just make sure that you are always staying up to date with Mm -hmm. what's next. Keep looking forward. Um, Of course, you want to look back and and kind of reflect on, okay, that didn't work. I shouldn't do that again, you know. Mm -hmm. But Mm -hmm. as far as trying to move yourself and your business forward, always be looking at what's what's next. It's part of the reason that I'm going into 3D. Um, Mm -hmm. And the technology, like leverage the technology as much as you can, especially now, because that is really where the next, um, I saw something recently where uh, there was a gentleman talking about the fourth industrial revolution. Mm -hmm. And um, I I agree with him. Yeah, there's going to be, you know, there's, there's the next arena where all the jobs are going to be, where all, all of the new developments are going to be, it's in technology. So mm-hmm. how do we leverage that technology with the creativity? Because you need the mm-hmm. creativity in order for it to be fun and interesting and exciting for all mm-hmm. of us to even want to use the technology, right? So that's where yeah. we all come in as the creatives. So keep your eye on that and just keep moving forward and just start whatever you want to yeah. do. Start and keep dreaming. Yes. Um, and then our last question for today, we ask everyone on the get on the show where you put yourselves on the powerful lady scale, um, zero being average everyday human, 10 being the most powerful lady you've ever imagined. How do you feel today and how would you score yourself on average? Um, today, I, it, it would probably be the same as on average. I would put mm-hmm. myself at like a, well, okay. On average, I'm probably maybe a six or five and a half to six. Mm -hmm. Today, I feel like five, five and a half, only because I'm a little little tired today. Um, (laughs) But I'm striving for the 10 and then some. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it has been such a pleasure to have you on the Power Plays podcast. I think we could probably talk for hours, so (laughs) don't be surprised if you get another invite for the podcast. Um, But thank you so much for being a yes to me and the powerful ladies. And I can't wait to see you again on our uh, future episodes and our next conversations. Thank you so much for having me. I had such a great time. (laughs) My pleasure. Mikkel is awesome. She's an example of how if you keep following and needing your way through your industry of choice, you will find your special niche. You'll see the gap and be able to say, I can do that. Or ask, why isn't someone else doing that? And that's when you know you found your thing. To connect, support, and follow Mikkel, you can follow her on Instagram, 383design. Visit her website, 383designstudionyc.com. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Powerful Ladies Podcast. There are so many ways you can get involved and get supported with fellow powerful ladies. First, subscribe to this podcast anywhere you listen to podcasts. Give us a five-star rating and leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Follow us on Instagram at Powerful Ladies. Join the Powerful Ladies Thrive Collective. This is the place where powerful ladies connect, level up, and learn how to thrive in business and life. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube page. And of course, visit our website, thepowerfulladies.com. I'd like to thank our producer, composer, and audio engineer, Jordan Duffy. Without her, this wouldn't be possible. You can follow her on Instagram at Jordan K. Duffy. We'll be back next week with a brand new episode. Until then, I hope you're taking on being powerful in your life. Go be awesome and up to something you love.